Hello, everybody, yet again. Uh, well, I think this is the first time I have made a promise to do anything daily and have kept to it. <laughs> um, well, as I told you yesterday, I would be taking all of my favorite authors, among many of the others that I talk about on a regular basis, and I would be doing videos on each and every one of them. Uh, really getting into their careers, getting into their styles. Uh, for this video, it is Victober, and one of my top favorite writers, Henry James, began his career during the Victorian era. He was American, but he primarily wrote in England, so I think that uh, that gives him some extra points. Um, okay, here, what, what I want to do with this today is there are a few videos, very few actually, very few videos on YouTube that suggest any one of his works as a, a starting point that really get into him at all. I've seen a few university lectures, I've seen one or two booktuber videos on a select few of his novels. Um, but he, he, he's not very well represented on booktube. So I would like to spend some time with him today. And to start with, uh, yes, this is my kind of starter kit for him. I did not begin with his novels. I did not begin with any of his more, shall we say, um, well, as the critics say, opaque and convoluted works. I started with a couple of his novellas, his travel writings, uh, particularly the ones that he finished while touring Europe, and his early and middle period essays, including one that I will talk to you about today, The Art of Fiction, which he wrote in order to uh, liberate the imagination of the writer so to speak. I'm going to start with the travel writings. These here, I have the, as I told you, the Library of America editions of his, his well, just about everything, really. I have, uh, here are the collected travel writings for the continent. Let me see if you can see that at all. Oh, look at the glare of the sun. Well, it's... <laughs> Now, there we go. There's something for you. Um, oh, dear. Well, looks like the glare is really coming in. Just a moment. So sorry, everybody. All right. Oh. I think we're okay. Anyway, these are his collected travel writings from Europe. Uh, primarily in France and in Italy. Now, what do I love about the travel writings? The, the ones on the continent, on Europe, are not as, I suppose you would say, difficult as the ones on America that he wrote later. The American scene, uh, are, that's the title he gave to his collection of travel writings on America. He wrote those when he returned to the American continent some years after moving to England, and he wasn't very happy with what he saw. But this one on Europe, as I'm sure some of you know, he was very much to the frustration of his older brother, William James, very dedicated to European culture, the European aesthetic in literature, and uh, their irony. There's a, a, an immense irony, a, a very sophisticated irony in European fiction, culture, art generally. Uh, pointed out, of course, by such aesthetes before Henry James as Walter Pater and Oscar Wilde, who actually wrote at the same time as him, but still. Um, this book here, shows his disillusionment with Europe, his 
ability to truly see what was in front of him. He did not have any... By the time he moved into his middle period of writing, he was finished with any fantasies about the European culture, European art. He did not... He moved into his later novels with many darker ideas, many more analytical, more dramatic, and certainly more penetrating thoughts. But the travel writings here, there are many writers who have written on places that they visited. None, though, that I have read have ever done it with so much poetry of observation, surprising, very surprising insight into not only the, the, the feel of the locations, uh, James visited multiple cathedrals, palaces, castles, uh, ruins of many different sorts of places, um, monasteries, all of that. And he wrote about each and every one with a surprising level of, I would say, pathos and true, true visual knowledge. He, he, he understood exactly what he was looking at. That's not common among travel writers, not from what I have seen. So, this was definitely one of the books that made me fall in love with him. Uh, the, the, the James sentence is one of, I think, the great wonders of the artistic world. Each sentence that he wrote was, as I said in my last video, of Mozartian perfection. Every word seems to be, you're surprised actually as you read through any of his work at the fact that each word seems to be in its place, no matter how opaque any of his writings may be, no matter how ornate and stylized anything may be, everything seems to be exactly where it needs to be. And certainly in the travel writings, that is extremely true. It is not boring. However, there is nothing boring about this book. Um, he may not have the indulgent kind of personality that Dickens had or that uh, Mark Twain had, but, and, and by indulgent, I mean that they more, they, they indulged in their, their rather extroverted literary personalities far more than Henry James did. J James, it's been argued that he, did, he didn't have a very extroverted personality in his fiction and whatnot, but there is so much energy. There is so much intellectual fire that there is no way for this to be boring. The same is entirely true. The very same is entirely true of his very large, large output of stories. These are, these are, this is a collection right here of his stories from 1892 to 1898, which includes, among many other wonderful offerings, the very, very famous, and now apparently very popular, the Turn of a Screw. There are two new film and television adaptations coming out this year alone. Well, actually, no, I'm, I'm sorry, one of them. Uh, the second season of The Haunting of Hill House is coming out next year. It's been pushed back, apparently, from something I read earlier online. But uh, uh, as far as I know, Steven Spielberg is still going ahead with his film version of The Turn of the Screw. It's a modernized account. But nonetheless, it is a film of the turn of the screw. The best I have ever seen, the best adaptation, is The Innocence. It's from uh, the early 1960s. It's a British film. And truly, 
an excellent one, an excellent one. The stage adaptation I love the most is the operatic one by Benjamin Britten, the English composer, composer ben Benjamin Britten. That work, the music gives you the full atmosphere that James gave you in his story. There is a, a the, the, the darker energies and hues underneath that James certainly, he certainly wanted to be received by the reader. And that's received by the listener who approaches Benjamin Britten's opera from any angle, any perspective. You feel it. You, you notice it. It's, there is no, in that way, there is no dissimilarity between the opera and the novella. Absolutely. It's my personal favorite adaptation. It is. I'm a lover of opera already, an extreme lover of opera and classical music. Uh, I, I keep a blog on it. I most of, if, if any one of my subscribers here has looked at the homepage of my channel, I'm, I'm sure any of you have seen the very, very large number of videos of uh, operatic singers from the late 1800s all the way up to the 1960s, 1970s that I have put into playlists that I have liked, uh, that I, I'm, I, 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 I'm completely obsessed with all things classical music, uh, including, I mean, probably most especially classical singing, although orchestral music is among the best also. I have many videos saved and playlists on that too. And if you really want to look at it, Henry James had a very orchestral, most of the estates did, they had a very orchestral way of putting their sentences together. There were harmonies between the words. You hear as you're reading, for one, the, the definitions. You get the sense of the definition of each word. Then you hear the sound of the word as it is placed next to another one and strung into phrases and really given its full power. And there are so many things that James shows us are required to really do full justice to the power of a word. And this means not the kind of uh, simple harmonies that you would find in, say, a a, a short story on uh, what what is that uh, shortfiction.com or shortstories.com um, something of that nature this requires extremely careful thought and well really a lifetime of development and like mozart james had a lifetime of development in his early years by the time he reached adulthood and started his career I like what William H. Gass said. He began in a late phase, and he grew phasier over the course of his life. <laughs> because that, that is the truth. Mozart and he both had, they were similar in that way. They began with all, it would seem, all of their artistic style, all of their intellectual faculties ready. Everything was ready. Now, the turn of the screw marks a uh, a more a turn toward the dramatic in James's career. He had just failed to. Okay, well, let me rephrase that. His play Guy Domville had failed to please audiences um, a couple of years before he began the turn of the screw. It really changed a lot for him. There's something very Rachmaninoff esque about the story of his failure with Guy Domville. Rachmaninoff failed with his first symphony. And uh, both James and Rachmaninoff descended into terrible depression afterward and emerged from that depression 
with much more, shall we say, sinister and much more, um, I mean, the, the ideas that they had afterward had, had more teeth, more complexity. Uh, there was something that just that they needed from these failures, and they got it. They, 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 I think they needed these failures to succeed in the rest of their careers. And certainly, James started to just, as, as he was morphing into the later phase over the course of the next decade after Guy Donville's failure, he, I would say, as much as he had already blossomed, he blossomed even more. And, and the turn of the screw shows how far the, the kinds of ideas that he had after Donville could blossom, how much potential, how much potential the dramatic had in fiction. Uh, more di he, he started writing more dialogue in his books afterward. He said, he then began talking about the sacredness of the scene and at every section to his novellas, every page of his short stories became in itself a full picture, a complete kind of, I mean, there's so, so many different ideas, themes were coalesced into a single mass in these works of his that wound up becoming so very impactful for their theatricality. The scenes, when put together, took on an even greater meaning. And then as all of the stories came to a close, including the turn of the screw, suddenly this eruption of energy just rocked. It, and it does, it continues. I mean, in the stories, this eruption of energy rocks the the reader it, it's and in the turn of the screw i don't suppose i should spoil the story too much i don't suppose i should but it is a very dark story and it is something of a haunted house story but that is only the beginning that really is only the beginning any time that henry james did anything the story was only the start when in this case, a governess goes to a, a house and is told by the man who owns it, you will take care of my niece and my nephew and you will not bother me with anything. I cannot be bothered with anything. It, it's a strange way to set a story up, one would say, but it works. James with this story, did everything he could to set up exactly the scenario he wanted, exactly the story he needed, and all the conditions that were necessary for him to express it, to express all ideas, his passions, his suspicions, his uh, all, all of the, the, and of course his fixations and fascinations concerning human nature. He made sure all those conditions were met. And sometimes it looks strange, and it does a little bit in the turn of the screw. The beginning is a, is a bit awkward, I would say, if you don't really know what James is doing. But it's by no means, uh, by no, <laughs> it should not be at all be off-putting. It is by no means badly done. It is not, it, there is no collapsing in Henry James. There is no, there is not a weakness to truly be discerned in Henry James, not so far as I have seen as yet. But the governess goes to this house. She takes charge of the two children, the niece and the nephew of this, this particular man, an aristocratic type of man. And uh, throughout, there's something akin to which um, Shirley Jackson did in fact, which is why it is so fitting that the new Haunting of Hill House season is going to be based on Henry James's The Turn of the Screw. She 
used the model. She used Henry James's haunted house model, uh, which was also a something he used for the Jolly Corner, a another magnificent story written much later. However, so I couldn't make the Victorian. Uh, I couldn't make the Victover cut. So I'm focusing instead on the Turn of the Screw. In this story, we have a question, the same as you do in Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House. Is this all in the mind of the governess? This is everything that happens in her mind. James wrote a brief essay on the matter in which he kind of says he, he wanted everyone to question. He wanted these things. There's a thing that you, again, there's this thing that you, you see in James every time you're going through him. You understand that everything happening is happening because he wills it to. James never loses control. It's not something that I see very often as a reader. I, I'm sure you, maybe you guys have seen some people that uh, have the same quality, this quality of absolute control. Um, nothing ever seems to get away with James, or from James, though. Nothing ever does. The governess, um, I forget which writer I'm paraphrasing here, but the governess and all others do exactly as he says when he says it. They don't move without him saying so. They don't speak without him saying so. And all the words coming out of their mouths and whatever descriptions he gives to their persons and to the action in the story is entirely what he wants it to be. There is no... There's no loss of power on his part. And sometimes it can be, that, that can mean, I know the, the, the dangers of such a thing, which usually, usually what I'm saying now would translate to stilted prose or um, extreme uh, even manipulation of the reader. The thing is though, you don't really get a sense of either of those as you're reading this. There is, in the, in the end sections, there is a, a sudden fire that starts. James bursts into, I mean, he, he, he grabs the reader and just takes off with, with them. The, you, it, it's actually rather, it, he moves flawlessly through the story. It, it's at a, a, a pace that begins very slow and picks up and picks up and picks up as he continues. Until at the end, finally, you are running with him. He is, he is, there is no, no sitting anymore. There is no walking. There is no trotting. You are running with him. You can barely keep up. It's uh, an astounding kind of, of not manipulation. It's a real, well, if you want to talk about moving the reader, I mean, there is a way to emotionally move a reader, but in this case, it feels almost literal. And um, now, what this does to, what this story does, is it sets up something that James, I wouldn't say perfect it, but put into more prominent use in the latter part of his career. That is what a lot of critics and exegetes and uh, scholars like to call the Jamesian suggestion. Okay? Everything is hinted at. Right. Um, you have the, the core issue, which all, everybody knows, a haunted house story is not about the haunted house. Right? There's always an idea behind it. There's always a, a larger human theme to a haunted house story. Henry James's you're not fully aware of what it is until probably halfway through the story. But that's the point of Henry James. He hints at it and hints at it. He hints at his point. He hints at his object, for instance, in the figure in the carpet or um, the aspirin papers. He hints at the object, the, the, the matter of it, the identity of it, the real um, in the case of the aspirin papers, the content of it. And he 
finally, in the very end, he either lets you have it, of course, in a, in a rather, uh, indeed, suggestive way. There is nothing necessarily blunt in Henry James ever. And I think that's what makes his stories and even his essays work so well. He is not trying to be just constantly direct with you, constantly simple. He doesn't uh, bother with a lot of colloquialisms or any kind of truly cold, hard prose. Just cold, hard, monosyllabic uh, utterances and, and uh, so, such as you would see perhaps in a Stephen King novel or um, a Hemingway novel or a short story. He, he never separates a point from the rest of the piece, from the rest of the, the, the page, in order to suddenly impact you, to, to make you see more clearly what he's trying to say. He doesn't want you to. He doesn't want you to feel as if he is giving everything to you. In the end, you hope to be given everything he's been hinting at the entire time, but sometimes you aren't. And in reality, it's okay. It's actually okay. If you're first starting out with Henry James, I could understand a little bit of your frustration if you have been reading Dickens, if you have been reading Austen and the Bronte sisters, um, and suddenly you reach Henry James and realize not only is his fiction a, a, an, animal of, a, an animal of its own, a, an animal alone in its species in a way, but also that it seems to, and believe me it doesn't, but it seems to disregard you as the reader because he doesn't have any intention of letting you know everything. He's not going to let you in on everything, even though that's what fiction is, I suppose you would say, supposed to do at some point. Uh, what a novel should do at some point, a short story should do at some point. He really doesn't do that. And the reason he doesn't is given you in this book right here. Okay, this is Essays, American and English Writers. I know, this is a fat thing. This is well over a thousand pages right here. Um, his essays are probably among the most exciting things he wrote. I mean, his, his full-on essays. I mean, his essays on writing, his essays on uh, literary culture in his time, uh, essays on the future of the novel, that kind of thing. His book reviews, too, which all could be classified as literary essays so far as I'm concerned, even the shortest of them, due to their enormous uh, well, their enormous subtlety. There is none of the usual kind of reviewing that you see today, for instance, or even that you saw at that time. There is, he writes every book review as if he's writing a full-on essayistic piece. There is no, again, no extreme directness in any direction, even if he doesn't like the book. He'll tell you in a way that he doesn't, but there is a way he does it that is, is I think, what makes him lasting. It doesn't feel so direct that it leans toward the, I, I, I should say, perhaps, um, who would be around uh, there, probably, like, Pritchett, hackishness, that kind of thing. Pritchett was a very talented literary hack, uh, but... Uh, he was not, he was talented as a reviewer. He was not necessarily an essayist. Henry James was an essayist approaching literature. And so he wrote in that way. Um, again, I'm, I'm not putting any of that down. I love Pritchett. He is 
he's, he's very uh, perceptive, and he pulls out the point of a novel, and he does hand it to you. He hands it straight to you, the core, the realities of the um, uh, behind what you perceive, that kind of thing. But he is far more direct, of course, than Henry James, as the style became after James and even during James's career. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I hope you guys can see my point. Uh, again, I'm still getting comfortable with this video making thing. I will get comfortable enough to finally be, shall I say, a little bit clearer, a little bit more listenable, perhaps. But in this book is contained Henry James's essay, The Art of Fiction. And this book, or this essay, gives you his entire theory on fiction. What does it mean? Who writes it? Why does one write it? How does one write it? And I think, to, okay, it, it's most famous for the passage, um, which, you know what, I think I will just, why not? I will just read it to you. This is the most famous passage from the art of fiction. Um, the power to guess the unseen from the seen, to trace the implication of things, to judge the whole piece by the pattern, the condition of feeling life in general so completely that you are well on your way to knowing any particular corner of it, this cluster of gifts may also be said to constitute experience, and they occur in country and in town and in the most differing stages of education. If experience consists of impressions, it may be said that impressions are experience, just as have we not seen it. They are the very air we breathe. Therefore, if I should certainly say to a novice, write from experience and experience only. I should feel that this was rather a tantalizing monition if I were not careful immediately to add, try to be one of the people on whom nothing is lost. That right there gives you a sense of exactly what he was doing with this essay. He was, as I said, liberating the imagination of the writer. He was saying in here, in fact, um, in this area, he was a little bit more direct than what he than was characteristic for him. Uh, he very much had something to say. This essay, in uh, a lot of ways, was like the rest of James's career, a sort of defiance of his brothers and his fathers. fame, ideas, reputations, as thinkers. He decided to counter them on a lot of levels. And one thing uh, William James was, the great pragmatist philosopher, he was a man who thought on moral grounds. He thought on the grounds of the needfulness morally, emotionally, psychologically, for people to do specific things. And, of course, pragmatism relates to the collective people all around. Uh, what is the... It's somewhat based on utilitarianism. Uh, John Stuart Mill wrote the, his, his amazing uh, essay putting all the ideas of utilitarianism in one place. But pragmatism grew out of that a bit. Uh, some people call it the American philosophic uh, school, philosophical school. It's, of course, not purely American. What really does belong to only a specific country. But that was not who James was, Henry James. Henry James was for a long time what would be considered a realist novelist, a realist fiction writer. But that didn't quite mean that he was particularly moral in his writing. He followed all of the high estates did, Walter Pater, and Walter Pater's theory, he became famous for the art for art's sake theory. And Henry James did not believe entirely in that. He didn't hold entirely with art only existing for its own sake. But 
he did believe that art was meant as an expression, a means of one's expressing oneself. He did not want it necessarily. He didn't really say that it should say anything. He didn't say it should in any way teach anything or enhance, or should I say add to one's principles. But he did believe in enrichment. And he believed in an outlet. Um, some would say that he required that outlet because of his uh, repressed homosexuality. But um, I think whether he was gay or not, artistically, this was just who he was. I, I think that, that when it came down to his subtlety, his expression, his particular definition of art as a means of basically holding it, it's a sort of uh, capsule for a person's psychology and emotional self and here is where he, he, got, he, he puts that into his own words um, a novel in its broadest definition, a, a person, a novel is in its broadest definition, a personal, a direct impression of life that to begin with constitutes its value, which is greater or less according to the intensity of the impression. But there will be no intensity at all and therefore no value unless there is freedom to feel and say. That was really his primary theory, that literature or that the writer should be freed unto literature, I guess you would say. He should be allowed to say what he needed to say, to express what he needed to express, because Henry James, despite the very, I mean, as you have heard, the very ornate, elegant, and incredibly, uh, shall we say, elevated, style, it's first and foremost also expressive. And it is a, uh, we, he, he demonstrated exactly what he was trying to say. Despite all of that elegance, he, he was trying, he, he used it to give all of himself in art. And he was free to say what he needed to say. He liberated himself so well as everyone around him because the esthetes never did anything just simply outwardly. They didn't simply, everything, well, everything in their lives were in some ways or others extensions of themselves. Their books, their novels, uh, from their novels to collections of travel writings to collections of essays, collections of short stories, everything was an extension of themselves. And people in the world were also extensions of themselves. They internalized everything they saw, internalized everything that other people did, other people would say. Um, it, so it's, it's, you really do get the feel. Henry James was certainly for the writer, and he was certainly for the reader, too. He was very much for the reader, and he wanted the reader to have that sense of an expression given, of a deeper truth, a deeper thought, a deeper feeling mirrored. The, 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 the feelings of the reader should be mirrored in a book. He believed that. And he gives that to us. He does in everything he writes. So, okay. I have gone on with that for a little bit. Um, this is probably, I'm going to say this is the beginning of a series of sorts on Henry James. This is where I do think you should start. Start with The Art of Fiction, his essay. Start with The Turn of the Screw. And start with his travel writings on the continent. I mean, start there and really see where the sentences, the expression, the the energy, the intellectual and emotional energy, really, I mean, see how far as a reader that takes you. 
I mean, I, I would not want anyone to be deprived of the experience of Henry James. The general experience of the esthetes is one to be treasured. Once you've had it, it's, you never forget it. You never forget your first enthusiasms. You never do. And, uh, uh, and how do I know? Because I have read Cynthia Ozick. <laughs> I have read William H. Gass. I have read Harold Bloom. And these particular critics never lost their enthusiasm for any of the high estates, any of the great writers who really tried. They really tried to give you the entire world in words, the universe in words, you, all of you, because the human is the universe. The human contains all. They knew that. So they tried to give you the entire human in language in words. And they did it in such a way that truly, if you are willing, you can receive it. So, I hope you enjoy this. <laughs> I don't know if I've made myself clear enough or whatnot. I would love to hear what you guys think about Henry James, what you think so far of Victober. If we are four days in, and uh, I'd like to know, what are you all reading? How is... I mean, what kind of challenges are you trying to complete of all of Lucy the Readers and um, our other hosts? Um, I mean, I, I would like to know. So, okay, I will see you all tomorrow. And, well, for now, thank you guys very much for watching. And again, thank you for all of your comments on the last video. You guys have been amazing. I'll see you tomorrow.